Welcome back to the first lecture on chemical process design. In this third part of lecture one, we're going to introduce how to turn a simple description of unit operation from a process flow diagram into a fully fledged piping and instrumentation diagram. To do this, we're going to talk through a systematic six step process that you can use. We'll start this process by considering the control system. Then we'll add on layers of increasing detail, addressing such factors as isolation, bleeding, nitrogen systems, pressure relief, and so on and so forth. Now the best way to illustrate this process is by example. So let's consider a simple three-phase separator that's used to separate vapour from two immiscible liquid phases. So here on my whiteboard is a simple sketch of such a unit. On the top left we have our feed stream coming in which will be multi-phase, vapour plus two immiscible liquids. And on the top right we have a stream for our vapour phase to leave. On the bottom right we have our organic phase leaving, and on the bottom left we have our aqueous phase leaving. Now let's make some assumptions. Let's assume that our organic density is less than our aqueous density, so our organic layer floats on top of our aqueous layer. Let's furthermore assume that the organics involved in this process are flammable, and so we're going to make best efforts to try and remove any electrical items away from areas which they can come into contact with a flammable gas. So, the first thing we're going to do is to think about the process and about process control. Now, in order to do this, we need to figure out what we can control. Specifically, how many things we can control. So, for a steady state, there's a rule of thumb that says that the number of control degrees of freedom is going to be the number of vessel connections minus the total number of phases minus one. So, let's think about this in context of our three-phase separator. We've got four vessel connections, feed plus three streams that leave. We've got three phases, vapour, two immiscible liquids, which leaves us with two degrees of control freedom for steady state. So we've got flow rate, we've got pressure. We haven't got temperature because we've got no way of heating or cooling what's in that three-phase separator. And if we consider flow rate, we might have already controlled that elsewhere on plant. For the major process flow through a plant, you only control it in one place typically because otherwise if you have multiple controllers on the same line they end up fighting each other and your control system simply won't work. So our steady state control might just be pressure. Now let's think about our unsteady state. Imagine when we're starting the process up or shutting the process down the liquid levels in that tank can change. They can increase or they can decrease and the relative proportion of the two liquids can change as well. So the depth of the organic layer and the depth of the aqueous layer can change with respect to one another. And so we have two additional degrees of freedom. We've got the total amount of liquid, and then we've got the ratio of organic liquid to aqueous liquid, in, in effect the position of the phase boundary between the two. So what we're going to do is control the steady state first, we'll implement pressure control first, and then we'll control the unsteady state last, which will be our two levels. Let's think now how we control that first item, pressure, the steady state um, degree of freedom. So here on my whiteboard in red, I've illustrated some instruments and some other bits of kit that we'll use to do that. Let's start right at the beginning, where the pressure indicator connects into the vessel. Note that the indicator is a physical device. It needs to bolt onto the vessel by means of a bolted flange. And it will probably sit inside the vessel ever so slightly. So we have a valve and we have a connection into that gas phase. So that, that sensing element has to be in contact with that gas phase. We may want to isolate that pressure indicator to remove it at some point, hence the presence of the valve. So the pressure indicator, the PI, is going to measure whatever pressure range we've decreed, let's say 0 to 10 bar. And there will be some electrical signal as a result of that. That electrical signal will not be one of the control standards. There's a current standard and there's a voltage standard. If we think of the current standard, it's 4 to 20 milliamps. And so we need to condition the signal coming out of that measurement device to fall in the range 4 to 20 milliamps. And that is a function of the PIT, the pressure indicator transmitter. So this produces an electrical signal, which is why we've got this dashed line um, shown connecting the clusters of instruments together. The electrical signal leaves the pressure indicator transmitter and goes to a cluster of three instruments. 
we've got two alarms now. We've got a pressure alarm high and a pressure alarm low. These will serve to indicate to the operator that there is a potentially unsafe situation developing. We've also got a pressure indicator controller. Now, this controller takes this electrical signal and feeds it forward into the next item on our um, control loop, which is a current to pressure converter, an I to P converter. The I to P converter is the box with a slash across it that you can see just situated above the control valve. The reason we're doing this is that we're going to elect to have a pneumatic control for our control valves. So our control valve actuators are driven by compressed air, but somehow the pressure of that compressed air has to be controlled by the electrical signal that we've already established, that 4 to 20 milliamp signal. So that 4 to 20 milliamp current comes into the I to P converter. In effect, this is a valving setup. It too is a little control valve. We have compressed instrument air coming into the I to P converter, and the higher the current, the higher the pressure, for example. And then that pressure will be piped directly into the actuator that lifts or closes the valve seat. Note also on this diagram, we have a connection into the emergency shutdown system. That diamond with ES is emergency shutdown, and that connects directly to a solenoid valve on the instrument air. It might fully open or fully close that instrument air supply, depending what we want the shutdown condition to do. We may want to box the vapour in, shut the valve completely, or we may want to allow all the vapour to escape. What exactly happens is key to the design process and won't be, there's no generic statement we can make about that unless we know the process in more detail. So there's our pressure control system. We've got our pressure sensing element. We've got a means of converting what that pressure element measures into a standard um, form, in this case 4 to 20 milliamps. We've then got some alarms and a controller. We've then got a current to pressure converter because we're driving a pneumatic valve. And we've got a connection into the emergency shutdown system. So there's our pressure control. And note that the control valve assembly is marked with a shortcut. So I've got a little asterisk by that valve. And I'm noting that, of course, that control valve is actually got its own isolation valves, a bypass leg, a vent and a drain that we discussed in the last part of this lecture. OK, so that's the steady state control. Let's think about the unsteady state. I'm now going to think about how we change the position of the interface between these two immiscible phases. So there's a lot more shown with this particular control system. Let's talk it through bit by bit. Again, we're going to measure a pressure, but we're going to do this in a different way to how we measured the gas pressure. What we're going to do is to measure static head. And so to measure static head, we need two pipes. These pipes are connected into the vessel. We can see a pipe connected to the base of the vessel that contacts the aqueous liquid and into roughly the midpoint of the organic liquid. So these two small bore pipes are valved because we may well want to take them off at some point or isolate the instrument that's connected to them. Then shown normally open because we want that fluid to sit at a given static head. And they feed into a differential pressure measurement device. PDE. Note that these two small bar pipelines also have drains associated with them, those two normally closed valves. And so when we think of just a differential pressure measuring element, there is pipework and valving associated with that. What we're then going to do is take that differential pressure measurement, as measured by the static head in the left-hand tube and the right-hand tube, convert it into an electrical signal, as we did before, 4 to 20 milliamps, and then we're going to take that forward to a level controller. So we're going to take pressure information and we're going to infer from that level information. And that's the job of the level indicator controller, the LIC. Again, we've got two alarms, a high level alarm and a low level alarm. These are informational and will alert the operator. Leaving the level indicator controller, we have another electrical signal, 4 to 20 milliamps, going into our current to pressure converter. Again, we're electing to use a pneumatic control valve here for safety purposes, and so we need to convert the electrical signal into an air supply pressure. Connecting into that IP2P converter, again we have our instrument air supply, and again we have input from the emergency shutdown system, the action of which will be specific to the design in question. So there we have another way of measuring pressure, 
we're using static head measurements in liquids and from that we're inferring a level in the vessel, specifically the level of the interface. We're going to implement a very similar system for the final unsteady state degree of freedom, which is the total amount of liquid in the tank. So we're going to again take a differential pressure measurement. So remember what we need to do is to have two pipes leaving our tank which contain enough information to infer a differential pressure. In this case we're taking a vapour pipe and a liquid pipe and so in effect we're looking at the static head of liquid with respect to whatever the pressure in the gas phase is. We're then doing that signal conversion, we're taking a a pressure measurement into a standardized electrical signal, 4 to 20 milliamps. We're feeding that into those three blocks again, a level controller, so we infer level information from that pressure signal. We've got a high level alarm and a low level alarm. We then take the electrical signal into an I2P converter. Again, that is connected into the emergency shutdown system. And the result of that I2P conversion is a pneumatic signal that drives a pneumatic control valve. So there are the three control loops that control this process. Now, let's stand back from the detail and we'll notice that we have a standardised numbering system. The steady state control loop, the first one that we talked about, the pressure control, all of the instruments and devices associated with that are tag number 101. The level control for the interface position is 102 and the organic phase level is 103. And so we can tie in very easily which instruments belong to which control loop. So all the instruments that belong to the brush control loop are tag number 101 and so on and so forth. Okay, so we've got our control system. Let's evolve the PNID one step further. We want to be able to safely isolate this unit in times of shutdown. There could well be a cause for people to enter this unit to inspect it. We want to be relying on more than just a single closed valve to do this. And so the standard is double block and bleed. The double block means that you're shutting off the connections to and from this vessel in two ways, two different ways. I've illustrated on here valves, indicated as normally open, and also spectacle plates. These are solid pieces of material that you can insert into a pipe flange and bolt it shut, and they provide a solid barrier that can't easily be turned on or turned off to any flow in that pipe. So double block and bleed is the standard for isolation. So once we've isolated, we can now think about whether we need to take any additional information from the measurement devices we already have. We've satisfied our control purposes. We may have additional information requirements, though, for financial purposes, say. And so I might want to log, for example, mass flows of material so I can keep an eye on how much material has entered or how much material has left the tank and then maybe convert that into some cash revenue on a, on a spreadsheet. So here on the whiteboard, I've illustrated two mass flow monitoring schemes. Let's talk through the liquid phase one first. That's in purple in the bottom left of the diagram. What I'm doing here is I'm taking information from an orifice plate. The orifice plate has got two asterisks by it, hence this is a shortcut symbol and there will be information on the PNID which shows the exact assembly that surrounds this orifice plate. And from an orifice plate I will measure a differential pressure and from that I will infer a flow rate. So my flow rate signal gets passed electrically into a computer system which is that slightly diamond shape um, arrow symbol within that box. But I'm also having a second system feed in there as well. So in, a sec in effect what I'm having are two ways of measuring the flow. Perhaps it's a particularly important flow and we need confidence that what we're measuring is actually what's happening. And so we measure it in two different ways and see if they're the same. So I have my flow meter measuring pressure but I also might then have something connected into the static head of the tank. Now Let's think about the gas flow. On the top right hand corner, we, again, we have another orifice plate. It's double asterisk, so it's a shortcut symbol, and there will be an assembly associated with that. And again, from this device, I'm getting some pressure information, which I'm converting into flow information. However, a gas is going to be very strongly influenced by its physical conditions, its temperature and its pressure. 
that will affect its density, which will affect what the mass flow is. And so I have additional information going into my mass flow calculation here, which allows that flow to be corrected. So I have pressure information, which is derived from my pressure control loop, control loop 101. And I have additional temperature monitoring just downstream of the spectacle plate. And so I have a temperature indicator and then a temperature transmitter, a TI and a TT. Again, there is electrical information being transmitted into the mass flow indicator recorder, the MIR, and that will again be something along the lines of the 4 to 20 milliamp signal that is one of the control standards. So we've got instrumentation that's been present for a control system that we're also using to glean different bits of information. Sometimes we have to add on additional instruments in order to do that. For example, the temperature monitoring for the gas phase in order to make a correction to the flow rate that's measured by the orifice plate. Now, the next step is to think about how we drain a vessel down. We've got our vessel isolated. If we imagine we're setting up a maintenance procedure, we've made sure that nothing can enter and leave the vessel to or from the process, but we now need to think about how we drain it safely for people to enter. And there's a few steps to this process. So the first step is to make sure we can remove the liquid. Now, the key question then becomes is, where do we drain the liquid to? We can't just dump it on the ground. Um, and so there needs to be some liquid effluent treatment facility to which the inventory of this tank can be sent. And so if we consider the vessel, if you look at the aqueous phase line that leaves, because it's the lowest line in the vessel, and so everything will drain through that line if we drop the level down, we'll see indicated in light grey there is a normally closed valve that leads to a line that leads to a tag saying liquid effluent treatment. Note that there are other connections into this effluent line as well, and these come from the major pipelines, because if we're draining the tank down, we may well also want to be removing items such as valves, or especially control valves, and so we may want to ensure that our lines are empty of liquid too, and so there are drains on the aqueous line, on the organic line, or on the feed line. Now, we've got drains, but no means of actually displacing the liquid with a gas. So we need to think more about how we do this. So let's think about venting and pressure relief next. Now venting in this case is not where we're displacing the liquid with a gas. Venting is where we're removing flammable gases from the system. And pressure relief is part of this. So if we think of the pressure relief first, this is a key critical safety application. If we look at the vessel, we can see illustrated centrally at the top of this vessel in green, we have a bursting disc. Should the pressure in the vessel exceed the bursting disc pressure, the disc will rupture, and the gas phase will be vented into the pressure relief header. Note that the tag on this green line says flare, and so we've said that if there's a pressure relief situation going on, any organic vapours will be burnt. Note there is no valving around this bursting disc. The last thing we want to do is inadvertently isolate a critical safety device. And so there's no valving upstream, there's no valving downstream. As with the drain, it's not just the bursting disc that connects in to this vent header. From every part of every pipe, we also have normally closed valves that allow us to remove harmful, potentially flammable organics. Because again, if we're taking instruments out of pipes, we don't want whoever's doing that to be hit in the face with a great big cloud of organic vapour, potentially toxic organic vapour, potentially toxic, highly flammable organic vapour. That would be a serious safety threat. So what we're doing is ensuring that we have a safe means of disposing of all the organic vapours that are present in this system. So we've got a means of getting rid of our liquid effluent. We've got a means of, in effect, getting rid of our gaseous effluent but we still have no means of displacing either of these effluents with something else. And this is where nitrogen systems come in. If we didn't have a flammable system, we could quite happily have an air system here that would just push out all the vapours and would allow the liquid levels to drop and allow the air to backfill that space left behind by the liquid. However, if we have a flammable surface, what's going to happen if we vent with air 
is that an explosive atmosphere will be formed, which is a lethal situation that we don't want to encounter. So rather than use air, we will use a gas that doesn't contain oxygen. And the cheapest, one of, cheapest most available one that, that we can use is nitrogen. So what we'll have is a nitrogen backfill into the vessel. So when we open the liquid drain, nitrogen purges into the vessel to displace the liquid. Hence the liquid will actually drain. We will also open the vapour vents in that vessel and in all the pipes and nitrogen will push out all the flammable vapours towards the flare. So by having suitable drains on every pipe and on the vessel, by having suitable vents on the vessel and on every pipe, and by having a suitably interconnected nitrogen system, we can remove all our liquid, we can remove all our vapour and safely dispose of both, and leave the vessel in a non-flammable state. Now, as a point of note, if our vessel is inert with nitrogen, we also need a means of getting rid of that nitrogen prior to anybody entering that vessel, because what we ha have is an, a severe asphyxiation hazard. And so typically you would have maybe an additional manway on this vessel, which you could then attach a fan to and suck out or blow out all the nitrogen once any flammability risk has been removed. So we're nearly complete in terms of setting up our PNID. The finishing touches are to do all your piping calculations, work out what your pipe diameters are, and to generate a piping code for each line. And so our nominal diameter, our unique line number, material information, and pipe con materials of construction, along with insulation and trace heat requirements, are then illustrated on every single line code. We've also added more detail onto the entry and exit tags. We've described conditions, pressures. We've described continuation information, where the streams come from, where the stream goes to. And so if we follow this process, these six steps all the way through, what we will end up with is a completed piping and instrumentation diagram. And we've done this in a very systematic, very rigorous way that allows us to make sure that we've addressed every aspect of the design required and the information required to be shown on the PNID. So let's summarise a few key points. The first thing we do is to work out the number of degrees of control freedom for the steady and unsteady states, and then specify the control system for these first, the steady state, then the unsteady state. We then specified unit isolation, double block and bleed. We then thought about any other desirable measurements that we wanted to take from this system. In this case, we illustrated mass flow, and that required also putting in place some temperature monitoring for the gas phase. We then specified vessel drainage. We want to make sure that all the liquid effluents get safely treated. We also need to think when we're doing this how the vacuum gets broken. So if we've got flammable organic liquids, we're not going to break the vacuum with air. If we've got flammable organic liquids, we're going to have a flammable organic vapour. So we also need to specify vents so we can safely get rid of the gaseous effluent. We also specify pressure relief, and typically this may or may not lead into the same vent header. We then specified nitrogen systems, and this was to prevent the formation of explosive atmospheres and allow the vacuum within the vessel to get broken as and when the liquid level drops. Note the key safety threat with nitrogen systems is asphyxiation, and so there needs to be a way of removing nitrogen once a vessel has been made safe from a flammability standpoint. The final points were to add on line codes, to flesh out the information on the flags, to write our commentary, specifically how our control systems work and how our emergency shutdown systems work and how our trips and our safety systems work, and then that is a complete job.